Coming up on Shamrock Sports, we'll break down Notre Dame's big win over Kent State in the first round of the NCAA Women's Basketball Tournament. Then, we'll look at how the Irish match up against Ole Miss in the round of 32. Can Notre Dame overcome the Rebels' size and depth? Stay tuned to find out. You all know it, you all love it. Sham Bookie is back. Stay tuned to see how our experts break down the lines for this coming week to make sure you win big. This is March. This is Shamrock Sports. Live from the second floor of the Duncan Student Center, it's Shamrock Sports. I'm John Bailey, joined today by our basketball experts, JJ Post and Jake Miller. And before we dive into the X's and O's of the tournament, I want to ask you guys a very important question. Do you know who Andy Williams is? No clue. Okay, well I thought so, but let me tell you, I have a bit of a grudge against this guy because in 1963, he issued a bold declaration that Christmas time is the most wonderful time of the year. But we, the enlightened folk here at Shamrock Sports, know that in fact, March is the most wonderful time of the year because NCAA basketball, the tournament is upon us. March has descended upon South Bend, and in the round of 64, your number two ranked Notre Dame Fighting Irish took on the 15 seed Kent State Golden Flashes. Anna DeWolf and the Irish got off to an early start for Notre Dame, and they never looked back, winning the game 81 to 67. Sonia Citron had a big performance as well. 29 points, six boards, four assists, and two steals on 65% shooting from the floor. Myself included, a lot of people are saying this is the Sonia Citron game, but Jake, I know you say Hannah Hidalgo is actually a big reason why Citron had the success that she did with her playmaking and passing yeah. ability. You know, they played a good Kent State team that really did a nice job at the end of the season in the MAC. And Kent State's head coach at the end of the game in the press conference said something that was interesting. He said, we knew we had no shot if Hannah Hidalgo gets 25-30. But so they really forced her. They wanted to go to the ball. They wanted to stop Hannah Hidalgo from being able to drive. Well, that works. That works for you if you don't have shooters. Notre Dame had shooters. Mm -hmm. Sonia Citron tied with a career high for 29. Great day from her from three. Maddie Westbelt helping out as well. Really good performances all across the board. Becky Obinma gets some playing time, comes back from the concussion, plays some nice one-on-one -on -one iso ball. Notre Dame zone looks good. They had the time off. They were probably a little bit too physical, too many personal fouls, um, you know, with Westbelt ending with four as well. But they look good, and if they're – if that was a warm-up game, it was a good warm-up game for them leading into Monday's matchup. Mm -hmm. I think it went about as well as could have reasonably been asked. I mean, obviously you want to win these games by 30 points. Yeah. If they were 30-point favorites, that would have been ideal to match that. Yeah. But I think we all know when teams play like Kent State was going to play, which is fearless, with a week to game plan, with a week to key in, with, uh, in terms of pure numbers, advantage, in terms of how many players they can put out on the court, you were never going to see this game become a true pullout. Notre Dame, however, after a, you know, a rough first two minutes, I'd say, yep. they controlled it the whole way through. Once they found their groove, they they, they kind of figured out how to really keep on breaking down Kent State's zone in unique ways. They were attacking with cutting. They were finding their shots. You know, this was another offensive performance that looked like a team that didn't need Hannah Hidalgo to drop 30, which was not always a guarantee in the middle of the season. Sometimes it was Hidalgo run the offense or bust. This was an offense that was, hey, if Westbro can get an open look, we'll use that. If Citron can get an open look, we'll use that. If we can get Nat Marshall on an ISO, we can use that. They looked like an offense that was more diverse than they've ever been, and that's going to be a real strength for this Notre Dame team as they face a tough old Miss team. It was interesting at the press conference today, uh, Matty Westbelt and Sonia Citron were asked, what do we need to do to be, keep moving on? And really, they were asked, do you need to be a big three? And Westbelt said, no, we need to be a big six. We need to play all six players. They're going to be out there, um, possibly seven, possibly eight, if it stretches that far, depending on foul trouble and where things end up. The team, I think, is at a point where they play really well together as a unit. They play nicely. They can talk well on both sides of the ball and communicate. Uh, if they're in a good place as much as they can be with this roster, with the size, to compete going forward. And a lot of Notre Dame's success came from their aggression on the defensive end, pushing the pace and transition. How are they going to be able to maintain that aggression without getting tired with such a limited bench, and especially if they get into foul trouble? What do you guys see in how they can adapt to that going forward in the tournament? I think the zone is going to be, you know, we said it in the first show, it's going to be very key because, you know, the fact of the matter is Notre Dame has seven players, eight if they really get into foul trouble that they can use right now. Just pure health. 
and they're going up against an Ole Miss team that they have five players in the starting lineup that are over six mm -hmm. feet tall. Against a team that is down their best shot blocker and is really has only two players that are traditional post players, that's not an easy task. But when Notre Dame goes to the zone, they can allow Matty Westbelt to kind of shift down low and be a defensive threat. They mm -hmm. can allow players like Nat Marshall to be a bigger defensive presence because they're tasked with guarding the space and not a man. Notre Dame needs to rely on mixing up those defensive schemes, making teams see different looks, you know, being able to make sure that they get players out when they need to be out. You know, so when a player goes to free fouls, that means they're sitting no matter what. You can't afford to lose any players at this yeah. stage of the game. So you got to be really careful how you manage your minutes. Against Kent State, Notre Dame did really well. They got four players, uh, three players, two four fouls. No one went to five, though, and that's going to be key. That you can, ha you're going to have to take fouls. Yep. That's going to have to happen, but you can't have anyone foul out. I'm going to go in the other direction and say that Notre Dame can help control the pace by taking contact. It was an interesting game officiating yesterday. I thought it was a fair game. Mm -hmm. Notre Dame got all those fouls, and the refs were allowing a lot of contact. Mm -hmm. It wasn't that the refs were calling everything, and that's the reason Notre Dame got it. Notre Dame got these fouls. A, some were unnecessary, but B, it was that you know being very physical down in the paint. If Notre Dame gets a game like that in the future, it needs to use it um, for its own good on the offensive side of the ball. Hannah Hidalgo drives, goes in the paint, mm -hmm. gets contact as she goes up and tries to get an and one. You didn't see a lot of the outward momentum on her arms. It was very much straight up on both sides of the ball. Nat Marshall, that's been a big problem this year on the defensive side, the overcrowding, she was straight up. Maybe Notre Dame sees that things aren't being called. Use that to your own advantage on the offensive side of the ball. Try to get to the line a little bit more, some more and ones. Okay. And say the worst case scenario happens, Someone gets four fouls. Who do you trust to go to on that bench? Do you think Becky Obinma can step up and play extended minutes in this tournament? On offense, I do. On okay. I, offense, I think she matches up nicely with a lot of posts. I think she has the size and the um, the size, and you know she's been able to play for so many years. She's a very mature player. Uh, obviously, one on one iso ball with Becky Obinma is nobody's uh, nobody's desire. That's not Notre Dame's offensive game plan. I think she would struggle on the defensive side of the ball. She doesn't move as quickly in the zone, and a man might not be the best matchup. But worst comes to worst, I'm not as afraid of Becky Obinma as some of the Notre Dame side might be, and I really hope that she does get a few minutes in this game. Okay. Yeah, I think you're going to have to. The yep. um, fact of the matter is, if Notre Dame has a player get into four fouls and you know they're going to need a post presence, they can't just you know say, okay, we'll throw our normal five out there. Yeah, you, you, you can't, really you're, can't. That's a recipe for disaster nope. mm -hmm. because then you're just going to tire everyone out. Obinma, and granted, small sample size, yep. granted, it's Kent State, looked very much like a player that could eat up some minutes against mm -hmm. Kent State. You know, She wasn't going to set the world on fire. She had you know, two points. Yep. Uh, I think she had a block shot too. But if that's what her production is in a limited minutes, that's good production. You know, if Obinma's role on the Notre Dame team is a player that effectively gives you seven minutes a game, maybe a couple points along the way, and is an effective part of that defense, that is a very good role for her. And that's, I think, if you're Notre Dame, you'll leap at that every time. I think against Kent State, she showed that in that very specific niche that they've carved out, you know, where she clearly knows what she's doing on defense, that it's not a confusion for her, that on offense, she's got a directive and she knows how to attack that directive. I think she can be a productive player, and I think she's going to need to be a productive player because it's inevitable that Notre Dame will get into foul trouble when you have a roster as short as they do. And I think I think even against Ole Miss, you should see a lot of more minutes for Abinma. I think with the size that the Rebels have, it's going to be difficult to play DeWolf and Hidalgo at the same time, especially because you can hide one of them. Hidalgo's great on defense. She's you know got six steals against Kent State. She's a force out there. DeWolf, you know, her size is a little bit more of a detriment to her and able to you know, be an impact on that end of the court. Other than that, what do you guys see for Ole Miss being keys to victory for Notre Dame? I think the interesting key is KK Bransford. Okay. Because she, she fits the mall. Like, you know, Hidalgo and DeWolf are kind of the exceptions to the rule. You know, they're guards and they're dynamic players. They're definitely more on the smaller side. Bransford's more of the big guard that you see the mm -hmm. game move into a player that she can handle the ball, no doubt. But she is a physical presence. She's not a player that will be back down easily. She's not a player that looks out of her depth when she's down low. I think if they can, you know, they're not going to make Bransford play power forward. But if Bransford can be <laughs> a player, if Bransford can be a player that is contributing on the boards, which throughout the season she's proven, she can be an influence mm -hmm. in that offensive uh, rebounding role. I think she's one of the best offensive rebounding rates on the team. If they can figure out a way to get her involved in that defensive structure where, you know, they have Hidalgo out there and she's a specialist. You know, Hidalgo's job will be to get steals, to be the point of attack. That's her role. If they can use Bransford in a way that, you know, has her be a guard, but also dropping down lower, being a bit more presence, I guess, especially against an Ole Miss team that relies so much on the big guards themselves, that could help alleviate some of the matchup problems that Notre Dame will undoubtedly run into against a team that fields five players over six feet tall. And this is a spot where you really wish you had Olivia Miles. Average over seven boards last year. I think she would have been really important in this series. Notre Dame lost the rebounding game against Kent State. That's, that's scary if you're the Irish right now. And you really hope that you can do as much as possible because you know that even against Ole Miss, 
there's going to be more rebound opportunities. We'll head to the tape now. Mm -hmm. Can, uh, excuse me, Ole Miss does not shoot any threes. They're a very different team than the Irish have played in this year. They are not a terrible three-point shooting team. They know that. They don't even try. They're going to go <laughs> driving into the lane. They're going to use their size to their advantage. They're going to be taking a lot of shots from the free throw line, the ACC logo, those kind of lobs. They have a really nice soft touch across the roster. It's an interesting matchup because Notre Dame has never seen Ole Miss in women's basketball, but Ole Miss is a mature team. Last year, as they knocked off number one seed Stanford in the round of 32. And while we haven't seen seen um, Notre, we haven't seen Ole Miss. Kennedy Todd Williams, former North Carolina player, has seen Notre Dame several times during her career. Very familiar with playing in South Bend. The Irish are familiar with her. Neil Ivey is familiar with her. She's tough to guard. They have a lot of size. This might be a very, very difficult matchup. Notre Dame clearly is more skilled. They have more athleticism. Mm -hmm. uh, Ole Miss's man-to-man -man defense, which they mostly play, can be beaten. But it's going to be very difficult for Notre Dame in the current roster status where they are to compete to a high level. They have to take out any mental lapses and to ensure that they play a very consistent, very narrow, and very timely game. You mentioned maturity. I think that's the biggest thing, too, because one of the, the biggest keys for Notre Dame at Kent State was they dominated the turnover battle. I think at one point it was 15-3 to three yeah. at halftime. Uh, it didn't exactly narrow down in the second half either. One of the biggest strengths of this Ole Miss team is they are an old team, a yep. lot of seniors, a lot of graduate students. They are not going to give Notre Dame free possessions. And Kent State didn't really have any disastrous turnovers, I thought, but they definitely had some ones where it felt like Notre Dame kind of trapped them into, yep. you know, these situations where these experienced teams that can call out these traps that know what's going to happen. They're not going to force turnovers in that way. And if Notre Dame can't, you know, really force these turnovers, they're not going to be able to how to play in transition like they want to. Notre Dame's going to need to figure out a way to create that havoc, create transitional play without relying on Ole Miss to give them free chances. Because, you know, Kent State, you know, not a young team by any yep. means, but a team that you could tell, you know, was their first game in a while playing against a defense of Notre Dame's, you know, swarm yep. mentality, their caliber. Mm -hmm. This is not going to be the case of Ole Miss. We've seen you know, Ivy resort to the 2-3 zone a lot. It's worked well for the Irish. It's worked well for the matchup they faced. I think we see that a little bit less on Monday, not because it doesn't work, not because the team can't use it and they won't play less, but a lot of the, two th the shots that the 2-3 zone forces, um, you know, low efficiency shots, that nice soft touch that a lot of these players have, these big fours, these big fives that can shoot a one-hander from the ACC logo. That's a good shot for this team. I think more of a man look or maybe even a different zone is something you will see from the Irish going into the game. What do we foresee the Irish's offensive game plan being? With so much size on the defensive end for Ole Miss, do you think they're going to have difficulties attacking the paint? Are we going to see more of an outside game, more threes from Westfeld, some more hot shooting from the deep from Sonia Citron? What do you think, JJ? I think the game is here is going to be kind of one of those where it's determined on how the first few minutes go. I think yeah. they're going to start out having Hidal go, you know, in attack mode. If the referee is going to let her, you know, drive in, get to the line, then yeah. they're going to rely on that because they nothing Hidalgo likes more than getting to the line and you know attacking players. If she gets an offensive foul early on, you're going to need to rein in the game plan because you cannot afford Hidalgo getting more than one uh, offensive foul in this mm -hmm. game. You need to save some of those fouls for when Hidalgo gambles on defense because that's how her game works. Mm -hmm. I think this is going to be a game where if Hidalgo is able, the referees give her the chance to go in, attack, get up, get to the rim, they're going to rely on that because that is how you, you know, force these uh, forwards out of their comfort zone by making them defend in space against one of the fastest players with the ball in her hands in college basketball. If that doesn't work, though, then you have to remodify. You have to go maybe to a little more long game with the Wolf, Citron, Westbelt. We'll see how that works. And, you know, one of the things about Ole Miss is their coach said, you know, after the game, we got like five lineups we like. You know, we like to tinker. We want to have these different players on the court. That's not an easy offensive game plan because you don't know what they're going to want to line up as. And it's so interesting because they play up to 12 players. And when they say that, that's not just 12 players that can play and there's a clear lineation of where those players fall. Mm -hmm. No, the players are like tools in a toolbox. And you bring them out for different things. If you're Neil Ivey, you kind of have to go into this game I'm sure you have a plan but your plan for this game probably looks a lot more fluid than others you have to adapt to the referees you have to adapt to what can uh, to excuse me what Ole Miss is showing you I think it's going to be difficult but if there's an Irish team that can adapt it's this mature mature senior led team washer Anna DeWolf Maddie Westbelt possibly playing their last game for the Irish to lead the way Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely a tough matchup for Notre Dame. But before we dive into the nitty gritty lines of everything, let's take a quick break and look at our friends from ND Sunrise. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to ND Sunrise. This is the, the review of the Keenan Review. That's right, we've got a big game in Sim City. Plot twist, I am the Grim Reaper. Overall, this year's event was a rousing success. Would Notre Dame be the first one to, to accept ASL as a foreign language as a department?
Once again, I'm Elena Morgan from ND Sunrise, signing off. And now we're back for some sham bookie, giving you insight into all the lines for Notre Dame Ole Miss. And I'm gonna need some help with this because my only gambling experience comes from betting peanuts at baseball games. <laughs> all right, so we'll now take it back to not only our basketball experts, but also our betting experts. I have to say, last Both game. Experts debatable. We <laughs> had, our, we agreed on everything. We had mm -hmm. one correct, one that was not correct, and an even line. Mm. So I don't know. I guess we didn't make any mistakes. Hey, you would have won more money than you would have lost, and I think that's all you can ask for, right? There we go. So starting off with you know fairly simple thing. We talked about how Notre Dame started hot against Kent State. They ended up going up 22 to five in the first quarter. Will the Irish be able to replicate this, and will they be the first ones to get to 15? Jake. Oh, that's such an interesting question because you take a look at what Notre Dame was struggling with in the middle of the season. Terrible first quarter after terrible first quarter after terrible first quarter. The Irish have been pretty consistently good in the first quarter these past couple of weeks, uh, all the way going back to the start of the ACC tournament and the wrap of the ACC regular season. I see no reason that Notre Dame wouldn't come out strong, come out firing, come out using the transition ball. Whatever happens in the long run, I think Ole Miss might take time to adapt, and I don't think anything in Ole Miss's game plan immediately is going to be something that flusters the Irish so much. Maybe in the long run it will. I think Irish will be first to 15. All right, Jake Miller, Irish first to 15. For the sake of debate, I'll go Ole Miss the first Ooh, uh, 15. Okay. I think the one of the things we've learned about this Ole Miss team, at least in the first game, is they want to try to surprise you. They want to do unique things. I believe she had a quote after the game saying, the surprise is the thing that wins you wars. Yep. Something along those lines. Um, and she you know, she put her, uh, her money, money, money where her mouth is. She started a new player for the first time in two months mm -hmm. against Marquette, and it worked. I think against Notre Dame, they will deploy some sort of thing, be it a new maybe defensive structure, be it a new lineup again. I think they're going to try to do some new stuff. I don't know if it'll work because Ivy has shown she can adapt. You know, that's one of her strengths. But in terms of getting to the first 15, I think Ole Miss can do that because I think they're going to be coming out, chomping them a bit. You know, we talked about this last time. Teams love to play at Purcell Pavilion. They you do. Know, Kenny Moore talked about it. You know, this is a dream game for a lot of players because, you know, if Notre Dame's place in women's college basketball history, they're coming out ready to go. This is a team that's pulled up an offset before, so they have a mm -hmm. sense of, you know, we've been here before. Yeah, I think they get to 15 first. I don't know what happens after that, but I think Ole Miss is going to come out rearing, and I think that's going to be to their benefit. Something we haven't talked about yet that I think will be an interesting thing to consider in the game is what Purcell Pavilion is going to look like. <laughs> Nobody on this campus, I'm sure administrators or even more ticked off with the 2 p.m. start time for this game. I'll be in class. Cancel, cancel classes. <laughs> a lot of students cancel are going to be in class. I mean, maybe your fan base is going to be able to come out and support if they take off work or if they're retired, but it's going to be a tough place to play. Well, will this the first. Will this feel like a home game? Will it be a neutral site game? You're already limited in these NCAA games. Notre Dame can't have its in arena announcer out in the stands. You can't do everything. Your, your band has to be smaller. It's going to be interesting to see what the feel of this game is and to see um, if that Purcell Pavilion does provide uh, an atmosphere. I have no clue if it will. It's going to be fun to watch. Definitely going to want a bit of a home court advantage, especially early on. Get to the line, give the refs, you know, okay, yeah, we'll give that call to Hannah. <laughs> we'll get her some free throws early on. I'm going to agree with you, Jake. I think Notre Dame's up-tempo you know, start to the game, their aggression, is going to get them to 15 first, but it's going to be a dogfight the rest of the way. Moving on to Becky Obenma. She's been a topic of a lot of discussion here, and I know around for Irish fans around the country, she played three minutes against Kent State. Setting the line right now, over under four and a half minutes against Old Miss. JJ? I mean, anyone who listened to the first part of our show could probably guess where we're both going to go with this. <laughs> I'm going to take the over because I think it's going to be necessary. Mm -hmm. I think Ole Miss, with their tall, experienced lineup, is able going to be able to force the issue with Notre Dame in terms of fouls a little more. Mm -hmm. I think Notre Dame is going to want to have, if nothing else, another body who can soak up some fouls. You go in there, you know, even if she doesn't score at all, if she can reliably enforce the defense for you know five, ten minutes a game, that is something Notre Dame will dream about because it doesn't. It allows you to put Marshall on the bench and not take any fouls, yeah. put West Bell on the bench, not take any fouls, and obviously Notre Dame's offense is going to take a bit of a hit when they don't have a player like Westfeld on the court. But when Westfeld is at three fouls, to have a player that you can rely on to just soak up some minutes and you know maybe just be an enforcer on the inside, that has some reliability to it. I think against Kent State, obviously limited, limited sample size, and Kent State is a worse opponent than they'll see in Ole Miss. I think Obinma showed that I, I think Ivy was giving her a trial run. You know, can you go out there, look like you are ready to go on offense? She yeah. was, and look mm -hmm. like you were reliable on defense. Less so than offense, she was still reliable enough. I think Notre Dame 
uh, will take from that performance the a confidence that we can, you know, we're not going to start her. She's not going to be playing 25 minutes a game. <laughs> but to get some rotational role out of her, I think Ivy will need to do and will do. I'm continually impressed by how well Notre Dame responds to what Neil Ivey has in the toolbox, in her game plan, how well they listen to her, how well they listen to timeouts, and how well um, they listen to her during practice. You could see it in the open practice, how much attention they're paying to her, except for one thing. Neil keeps harping on the importance of foul or defending without fouling, hands straight up. I think Notre Dame does struggle with that. It, they, these, these players are so physical, so gritty that sometimes playing defense is just, especially in the post, when you don't have the size, is so difficult. I agree. I think Becky is going to be a necessity in this game, whether coach wants it or not. You know, obviously, based on what's happened before, the preference would be not to play or not to play or substantial, tangible minutes. I think we are going to see that out of necessity, maybe in the third quarter. I'm taking the over here. I think those are both very logical and well thought out points, but I really think that Coach Ivy has such a trust in those core six players. I think she's going to lean more heavily on Bransford because she does have the size that she can play a little bit down low. She can rebound really well for a guard, and I think that Becky's only going to get those spot minutes. So it's going to be close. I'm going with four minutes. <laughs> I'm going to zag and take the under. They round you down. Yeah, and I know. I hope that ESPN is generous with that for me <laughs> for the sake of my money on this one. There we go. And now back to the big one, the one that we all want to know about. As of this morning, Notre Dame is favored at 10 and a half points. Will Ole Miss be able to cover? JJ? I like Ole Miss to cover. Mm -hmm. I, I still would take Notre Dame to win the game. Okay. Um, but I think Ole Miss is a tough matchup for this team. I think it's one that will force this to be a close game down the stretch. Um, you know, we talked about this all day. The yep. matchup is not a good one for Notre Dame. This is a tall, experienced team. And if you're Notre Dame, the last two things you want to see are a team that's tall and a team that's experienced. Ole Miss checks both of those so boxes. Tonight. They've got a coach that has proven she can win in March and she can win against the best on the road in March. Mm -hmm. Again, not two things you want to see if you're Notre Dame. I think Ole Miss keeps this game close. I will still stick with Notre Dame because against North Carolina State, Hidalgo showed she has the takeover gene. I don't oh, think yeah. that was really something we had seen from her and all her freshman yeah. brilliance. She had never really been forced to take over a game in the final minute. She was able to do that down the stretch in the ACC tournament and in those final two home games against Virginia Tech and Louisville. Hidalgo I think Virginia. if you're Notre Dame, you are worried about this matchup. I think it's justified. I think Ole Miss will keep this close down the stretch. Mm -hmm. I think they cover 10.5 with relative ease. Final score? Give me 68 for Ole Miss and 70 for Notre Dame. All right. I think we go down to free throws at the Last end. Game. Wow, wow. You know, I don't think this is a good value bet. I thought that with the Kent State Notre Dame game was an easy call. I'm glad we did it. That bet hit. Uh, and I thought the line was too big. This, I think, is a very much a volatile line. I think it depends how well Notre Dame's shooting from the field, especially if, if they're having a great day. Notre Dame shoots line. 50 and 40 again. Very this well. game's not going to be close. If yeah, Sonia it's Citron, hard to be the team that does that. <laughs> exactly, yeah. If the Sonia Citron, Matty Westbelt, AD are able to produce from the three point line, it should be an easy day for Notre Dame, especially because Ole Miss doesn't shoot threes back. They're going to be getting twos after twos after twos. At the same time, you can't know that's going to happen. And I'm very scared on what this is going to look like defensively in the post for Notre Dame, especially if they can't play zone well. I will go against the spread, but I will actually go with Ole Miss as well. I think Ole Miss takes this one. Notre Dame does not leave South Bend oh, again, unfortunately. Man. As much as my heart says it, I, after watching this Notre Dame team so much, I don't think it's probably in their favor with this matchup. If I had to guess my score prediction, we're going to go Ole Miss 80, Notre Dame 71. Ooh, high-scoring affair, though. I think so. I will end the program with a little bit of optimism. <laughs> I will join JJ in agreeing with you guys again. Ole Miss will cover 10.5. That's, that's a lot that's for a really team. Generous line mm -hmm. for Notre Dame. I don't, yeah. I, don't, I don't know what the bookies are, on, are working with there, but sure, we'll see. I think Maybe this game's going to be close no matter bit. how it goes. Yeah, I completely agree. I think that the Ole Miss size is really going to bother Notre Dame down the stretch, but I just think, like you said, Hannah Hidalgo has this takeover gene. She's going to be able to come up big for Notre Dame in the clutch, and I think just kind of will the team to victory like she did against NC State. I get one more point here. I think the biggest matchup is not one that's on the court at all. I think it's the mentality matchup. Mm -hmm. On Ole Miss' side, you've got a senior team. You know, some players are playing their last game, and Notre Dame has those players, obviously, uh, DeWolf, Westbelt, maybe. But for Ole Miss, this is a team that maybe seven players will be playing their last game, yeah. and these are seven players that will be on the court. That's going to add a level of intensity. With Notre Dame, I think the factor is they're playing with house money. This is a team that doesn't have Olivia Miles, that doesn't have Emma Rich, that doesn't have Kassan Prosper. You know, the list goes on and on of what ifs for this Notre Dame team. And I think Notre Dame at this point has embraced that. They know this was not the team that anyone really expected to win the AC tournament. This yep. was not the team anyone expected to be a two seed. You know, I think that adds a level of fearlessness to the Notre Dame mm -hmm. game 
from a mental standpoint, I think it's going to be very interesting to see whether this Ole Miss team that doesn't want to end their career, that doesn't want to go home, is able to, you know, is able to outwill this Notre Dame team that is going to be more confident than ever because they're playing with house money. This is a team that everyone is, you know, I think even if they lose, everyone's be like, you know what? Hats off Notre Dame. They won an AC tournament with six players and four season-ending injuries. No one's going to credit them if they lose. And I think that almost makes the Notre Dame team stronger because they know they can be fearless out there. They can be confident. There is nothing that they can do, barring a completely embarrassing loss that I don't think we've ever seen Notre Dame have in the NCAA tournament, that would cause a negative reaction. There's a fearlessness versus a fear of going home, and I think it's going to be very interesting to see from a purely mentality standpoint which one wins out. Veteran wisdom, youthful exuberance, what's going to win? We'll have to find out on Monday at 2 p.m. on ESPN. Any party thoughts, gentlemen? You no, know, if this is the last time we're here at the desk, it's been a pleasure to cover this team. I hope we get another episode in to take a look at Albany. We will. I hope, fingers crossed, but regardless, you, all, you take a look at what practice is looking like right now. Olivia Miles is pretty much in full force. We saw the open media practice. When the Irish bring in Kate Koval next year and pretty much return the entire team, you have the best easily not even close guard lineup in the country with Hannah Hidalgo and Olivia Miles next to each other. Sonia Citron helping down in the forward, shooting those threes. Good bench, a deep bench, some transfers, and Kate Koval. The Irish are going to be the, should go into the offseason as the number one or the number two team in the country to start the season. It's an amazing team next year. Whatever they can do this year is, I think, great for the Just program. But looking yeah. forward, nobody is a brighter light than Notre Dame right now. Yeah, I mean, I, I, try, I try not to always focus on the next year element because I think that that causes you to sometimes warp your perception on the present. Mm -hmm. But it's very difficult to not look at what next year's Notre Dame team will be and not be extremely excited. You know, this is a team that has found an All-American level player as a freshman in the Stats say she'll probably only get better because she only has gotten better yeah. this year. Yeah. Then they supplement that with Olivia Miles, who is already an All-American caliber, maybe not first team, but yep. certainly getting towards first team, you know, in Olivia Miles. Mm -hmm. Then you add Emma Risch, who was, by all accounts, one of the better shooters on this team. Five and she player. was a five-star mm -hmm. herself. Kassan Prosper, who was contributing to this team as a high school senior. Yeah. She'll be back next year. Sonia Citron, we know who she is. She was playing like an all-ACC first team level player at the end of this year and was doing that last year before she got injured and eventually had to recover from that. You might have Maddie Westbell back, who is also an all-ACC level player. Kate Koval, probably the highest ranked center Notre Dame has had in yeah. forever. I, like, I can't remember the last time Notre Dame's had Finally a center some size in the, the modern team. era mm -hmm. as highly ranked as Kate Koval is. You would imagine they're going to add some transfers too. Mm -hmm. And that's not even counting that KK Branson will probably develop even more. Yep. This team, the arsenal of weapons they will have over the offseason that they will have a summer to mesh and get better. It's unprecedented in the Ivy era, at least. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, if we talk about next year, it is very difficult to see this team entering the year without, at minimum, the Elite Eight not being the expectation, which is somewhere Ivy has never gotten in her tenure. And that's a sign of progress to this Notre Dame team, no matter what they do this weekend. I think the future is definitely bright for Coach Ivy and the Notre Dame women's squad, truly proving himself as a rightful heir to Muffet McGraw. That'll do it for us. Notre Dame TV, Shamrock Sports. I'm John Bailey, and remember, go Irish.